it's Sharon. Welcome back to Zodiac Serial Killers. This is a brand new series I started for this year where every single month I talk about a new serial killer based on the Zodiac sign of that month. I started this back in Aries season, so if you'd like to catch up because we are now on Cancer season, definitely feel free to. I have a whole playlist on my channel. If you haven't seen this series before or you're just now viewing my videos for the first time, hi, welcome. This isn't my usual type of content, but this is something I've always been interested in. I have done some conspiracy, some murder mysteries, some true crime videos before. I also have that another playlist if you'd like to check that out as well. Mainly do that around a Halloween time, but I figured year round wouldn't hurt and I love astrology so might as well mix the two together. So if you'd like to see more videos like this, give us a thumbs up and let me know in the comments below. If there's a specific serial killer you would like to see, definitely mention that as well. And if you want to see more, you should definitely subscribe for more. But enough about that, today we are talking about a cancer serial killer and before I proceed with the video, I do want to give you a warning. If this triggers you in any way, shape, or form, you do not have to watch this video. So letting you know right now. This serial killer in specific sadly deals with a lot of death in babies and children. That being said, today we're talking about Janine Ann Jones, our first female serial killer in this series who's also known as the killer nurse. Jones was born on July 13th of 1950 and immediately given up for adoption by her birth parents. She was adopted by Dick and Gladys Jones who are a wealthy San Antonio couple. They had earlier adopted three children and Janine being the second youngest. They all lived together in a large and comfortable home just outside of the city. The father Dick was a professional gambler and a serial entrepreneur. First it was a nightclub, then a restaurant, then followed by a billboard business. All failed due to his free spending ways and it took a toll on the family. Even though Jones once said riding around in her dad's truck putting up billboard signs was one of the happiest times of her life, she still said that it felt like there was something missing at home. She often felt left out and neglected by her parents, often calling herself the family's black sheep. She continually faked illness for attention. Her one best friend was her younger brother Travis. Not only did she feel ignored at home, but at school she was unpopular and even disliked. Her loneliness was amplified due to her being short and overweight and was even described to be aggressive as well as a liar, a manipulator, and a betrayer. She felt she could trust and befriend her little brother. But her brother put together a pipe bomb and it blew up at his father's shop, killing him in the blast. Janine was heartbroken and at her brother's funeral, she was 16 at the time, she screamed and she fainted. During her senior year of high school, her father Dick began to get sick. He was diagnosed with terminal cancer and sadly passed a little over a year after Travis's death. Jones was so upset that even though she hadn't finished high school, she believed that getting married was the only option to relieve her pain. However, her mother Gladys wouldn't agree, so she had to wait until after graduation. After graduating from John Marshall High School, she immediately married James Jimmy Delaney Jr., a high school dropout. Soon after they were married, rumors started to spread that Janine had trapped Jimmy in marriage by faking that she was pregnant, and seven months after being married, he enlisted in the Navy and went away. Jones was unfaithful, and she went after any man that would have her. She even had affairs with married men and would brag about it in the open. Yet none of those relationships, including her marriage gave her enough income to live off of. She was dependent of her mother who urged her to find a job. So Jones enrolled in Mims Beauty School, got a job in a hospital salon, and started making her own living wage. Jimmy returned from the Navy and they had a child together, Richard Michael Delaney. After four years of marriage, Jones abruptly left her husband who was recovering in the hospital from a boating accident. She divorced him, though they reconciled and on July 17th of 1977, Heather, her second child, was born. Soon after though, her and Jimmy went their separate ways again. Janine's older brother, died of cancer not long after leaving Jimmy the first time. It made her scared of working with the hair dyes in the salon, and since she was pregnant for the second time, she thought she needed a job that would pay more than that in a salon. She left her own two children in the care of her mother and started to work towards becoming a nurse. She trained for a year in San Antonio to qualify as a vocational nurse. Her first job at the San Antonio Methodist Hospital ended only after eight months because she was fired for not listening to doctor's orders, often tried to make decisions where she had no authority and because she was apparently rude to a patient. Her next nursing job hit a wall as well. On October 30th of 1978, she was finally hired in the intensive care section of the pediatric unit of Baxter County Medical Center Hospital. She was an undisciplined worker. She spent more hours than required on duty, disobeyed orders, and did what she thought was best for the child. She even skipped mandatory classes and made as many as eight errors in nursing, including administering the wrong medicine. She liked to feel needed, and she would have been fired if it wasn't for the head nurse, Pat Belko, who was very fond of her. This fondness and protection made her even more confident, which made her crass and aggressive. She often talked about her sexual conquest at work and even had predictions on which baby was going to die next. 
Her attitude literally made coworkers seek transfers. In her personal life, she often thought she was ill and she made more than 30 visits to the outpatient clinics in two years, but was never diagnosed. The first child she picked up had a fatal condition and when he died shortly after surgery, she went crazy. She brought a stool into the cubicle where the child lay and she just stared at them. The other nurses could not understand her behavior. She hadn't even known the child and had barely been around him, so why the excessive grief? When a new director, James Robinson, came into the pediatric unit in 1981, he agreed to let Jones be in charge of all the sickest patients because she seemed to treat any patient's death with such respect. She would prepare the body, sing to it, and personally take the body to the morgue. The director saw it as a perfect example for the rest of his staff. He didn't even become concerned when children began dying in the unit from conditions that shouldn't have been fatal. It's claimed that there was a two-week period where seven children had died and the need of resuscitation was constant, but only when Janine Jones was around. Jones commented on several occasions that the excitement from an emergency was an incredible experience. One child had three seizures in a row, but only on Janine's shift. She even said, they're going to start thinking I'm the death nurse, ironically enough. She seemed to enjoy calling parents and letting them know about their child's death. And if a baby's health was bad, she would say to the other nurses, tonight is the night. If a child was near death, she took a special interest. It's like she always wanted to be there when it happened. Happened. Still, no suspicions were raised even when Jones' co-workers started calling her shift the death shift. No matter what rumors seem to be going around about her, Pat Belko and Director James, because I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce his last name, so I'll just refer to him as Director James, still defended her. They claimed these employees were just less competent nurses who were just simply jealous of Jones. One day, a six-month-old Jose Flores was brought in. He had common childhood symptoms, fever, vomiting, and diarrhea. But while in Janine's case, Hair, he started having seizures and went into cardiac arrest. Doctors found that his blood wasn't clotting normally and after an hour of working him, they were able to save him. Jose was going to live until Janine's next shift. Once again, Jose went into seizures and started to bleed uncontrollably. By early the next morning, his heart had stopped beating. Janine Jones allowed Jose's older brother to carry his body to the morgue, but after several steps, she grabbed the baby's body and ran down the hospital corridor. Several of Jose's family members ran after her, but she ditched them and brought the body to the morgue herself. When the blood testing on Jose came back, it said he died of an overdose of heparin, a blood thinner that had never been ordered for him. When Janine Jones became aware that those who were always in support of her became suspicious, she started to turn her back on them and resort to blackmail. She said she had she said she had records of every child that had died there and she knew which doctor had killed them. Director James requested that she be fired, but no one listened. They also did not listen to the nurse who kept reporting that supplies were missing. Then Ronaldo Santos a one-month-old baby being treated for pneumonia was suddenly having seizures, cardiac arrest, and extensive unexplained bleeding. All his troubles developed or intensified on Janine's shift. For the three days she was off, the baby's health improved, but the afternoon she returned, he had a heart attack. Lab tests showed an excessive amount of heparin. A doctor took over his care, but after Janine got a hold of him again, his health got worse and he went into a coma. A doctor saved him and then ordered him to be removed from the ICU of the pediatric unit and placed under 24-hour surveillance. Only under these conditions did he improve enough to be released to his parents. Rolando survived his encounter with Janine Jones and he was one of the very few lucky ones. One more doctor stepped forward to tell the hospital administration that Janine Jones, the afternoon nurse, was killing children. He found a small manual in her possessions about how to inject hairpin without leaving a mark. And of course, he had evidence of how Rolando Santos had suffered during her shifts. The hospital resisted. Another child was sent to the pediatric unit to recover from an open heart surgery. At first, he progressed well, but during Janine's shift, he became lethargic and eventually died. The doctors thought his death was due to some infection. In view of everyone in the room where the child had died, Jones grabbed a syringe and squirted fluid over his forehead in the shape of a cross, then repeated it on herself. She grabbed the body and began to cry. More doctors reported her. Disasters continued to occur and three-month-old Albert Garza died of an overdose of Harapin. The hospital administration cracked down on Harapin and its availability to the nursing staff but soon after, 11-month-old Joshua Sawyer died from an overdose of Dilantin. This is an anti-seizure medication. Director James started to fear that nurse Janine Jones was really 
purposely killing children. He began to complain to the hospital administration and requested a formal inquiry into her behavior, but they refused to do so because the negative publicity that the hospital would receive was not worth it. Instead, they decided to replace the licensed vocational nurses in that unit, like Janine, with registered nurses, which meant Janine Jones would be transferred away from the babies. In return, she resigned and the administrators found this as problem solved. In 1982, Dr. Kathleen Holland opened a pediatrics clinic in Kerrville, Texas. Dr. Holland had briefly worked at Baxter County Hospital with Jones and was even aware of this investigation. But Dr. Holland still gave her a job, believing that Janine was merely a victim of the male-dominated patriarchy. So even though Dr. Holland was warned not to give Janine Jones a job, she still went ahead and did it. She was even cautioned by Director James. Within the first several months of the clinic opening, seven different children had unexplained seizures. Each child was transported by ambulance to the nearby Sid Peterson Hospital, and hospital staff thought something odd must be going on, especially since the children were quickly recovering at the hospital. Dr. Holland assumed she was sent all the worst cases because she was a specialist and the children were just simply recovering. Months after Janine Jones left Bexer, someone found a novel with her name in it called The Sisterhood by Michael Palmer. The plot was about a group of medical professionals who pledged to end human suffering by terminating patients who they believed were better off dead. Known as the angel of death, this is someone who kills patients in their care. Patients that are selected are those that had explainable deaths, like those that were in some weekend or near fatal condition already. Easy to kill, easy to cover up. Now what fuels an angel of death is ego and a compulsion for domination. Janine is obsessed with the need to control those who are dependent of her. Some, like Janine Jones, are also motivated by a need for attention. While they seem to be going on about their days, they're making decisions on who should live and who should die. What happens to the patient doesn't matter to them. What matters is what the incident does for them. As you may have guessed, Janine Jones would inject her patients with drugs that were too strong for their bodies to handle. 15-month-old Chelsea McLennan died while en route from the hospital to another facility. Dr. Holland was devastated and started searching for answers. A doctor at Sid Peterson heard about the high baby deaths at Bexar County Hospital. He brought it to the attention of a medical committee and they asked Dr. Holland to see if she stocked or used a specific drug called, I'm gonna butcher this name completely, succinylcholine, chloine. Either way, this is a very powerful muscle relaxer and paralyzer. In high doses, it can cause seizures, heart failure, and lung failure. On September 27th of 1982, Dr. Holland examined the bottles of that drug she had stocked in her office. They were both nearly full, but one had pinprick holes through the rubber stopper. When Dr. Holland asked Janine about it, she denied any involvement and suggested that she throw it out to avoid questions. Luckily, Dr. Holland turned both bottles over to investigators. Investigators later discovered that one of the bottles didn't even contain that drug at all, only saline, so all of the drug had been used up and replaced with saline. To top it off, another bottle had been ordered, but it was missing from inventory. Dr. Holland fired Janine the next day and offered any help she could to investigators. Even so, families left her practice and Sid Peterson Hospital suspended her privileges. Holland was losing everything for hiring Janine Jones and even her husband divorced her. On top of that, Janine was trying to frame her and she was scared for her own life. At Chelsea's funeral, her mother Petty was unable to cope. She screamed and fainted and her, she screamed and fainted and her relatives sent her to get psychiatric help. One day, a week after the funeral, she went to the cemetery to leave flowers on her daughter's grave. As she approached the grave, she saw the nurse from the clinic, Janine Jones, there. She was kneeling at the foot of Chelsea's grave, sobbing and wailing the child's name over and over. Petty asked what she was doing there, and she responded with nothing but a blank stare. As if in a trance, she walked away without a word. When she was gone, Petty noticed that Janine had left flowers, but had taken a bow from Chelsea's grave. On October 12th of 1982, a grand jury in Kerr County held hearings on the eight children from Holland's clinic who had developed emergency emergency respiratory problems, and the one who had died, Chelsea. Her body was exhumed and it was determined that her cause of death was due to an overdose of that specific drug Dr. Holland was missing. In February of 1983, another grand jury was called in San Antonio, this time to look into the 47 suspicious deaths of children at Bexar County Hospital. All the deaths had occurred over the years that Janine Jones worked there. In a stats report presented at the trial, an investigator stated that children were 25% more likely to have cardiac arrest when Jones was 
was in charge and a 10% chance more likely to die. On February 15th of 1984, Jones was convicted of murder and she was given the maximum sentence of 99 years. Later that year, she was sentenced to another term of 60 years in prison for almost killing Rolando Santos with an overdose of heparin. Jones came up for parole several times, but victims' families fought to keep her behind bars and they were successful. As of May 2016, Jones was held at the Lane Murray unit of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. She was scheduled for mandatory release in 2018. This due to a Texas law meant to prevent prison overcrowding. This law says she could have been released after completing a third of her original sentencing. But to avoid this, Jones was indicted on May 25th, 2017 for the murder of 11-month-old Joshua Sawyer. In April 2018, a judge in San Antonio denied a request to dismiss five new murder indictments against Jones. On January 16th of 2020, Jones pleaded guilty to the murder of Joshua Sawyer on December 12th of 1981. This was part of a plea deal in which four other charges were dropped. She was sentenced to life in prison. As of 2021, she is 70 years old and will not be eligible for parole until she is roughly 87 years old. And that is all I have for you today on Janine Jones, also known as the killer nurse. In the comments below, I want to let you know what you were thinking, how you were feeling, what you think about this whole thing in general. I think it's absolutely insane and it's really disheartening how people were aware that something was going on and something was wrong and something was not right, yet the first hospital's administration team just ignored it because they didn't want the bad press. So because of their fear of this bad press, so many other children and so many other families had to suffer, which is just very heartbreaking. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you would like to see more, this is a brand new series I have on my channel. I do have several other episodes up already. I have Aries, Taurus, and Gemini. And of course, next month, I will be doing Leo for Leo season. If there's a specific Leo serial killer you want to see, make sure to let me know in the comments below. If there are any future ones you want to see, also comment that down as well. Now, shout of the day goes to Yara on Instagram. Thank you so, so much. If you'd like to be shout of the day, just follow me on my Instagram and stay active. And of course, like I mentioned, this is a brand new series. This is not my usual type of content, but it is something I've always really enjoyed. And I have videos kind of similar to this one. If you're into this on my channel, I made them around Halloween time and I usually make them around Halloween time. It's a lot of mysteries, true crime, scary stories, scary urban legends, all that good stuff. So you can definitely go binge that. And if there's a specific type you would like to see, definitely let me know as well. But if you want to see more, you should subscribe. And all that being said, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.